And what's the difference between the two hypotheses? We can see clearly from this example when we create a single working hypothesis, we restrict ourselves to only one choice. What if the free crane happens, which we have not assumed? What would be what would be in a challenging situation? We would be in a challenging situation. What if due to free cranes there is a havoc to the city? Our challenges would be further compounded. And when that happens, even if the chances are less, it would create chaos and discomfort to others, to us. In the case of multiple working hypothesis, we forewarn ourselves with multiple assumptions and hence we would be better prepared. Right? Many places I see this. People come, they've cut too fine on time of travel, coming to the airport, last minute they come, they rush, such an amount of stress. The hypothesis was, I can reach the airport within so much of time, why go early, why do this, why do that? And they are so sure about themselves until on a freak day something goes wrong. Could you have thought of that possibility? I go to a city where the travel from the airport to the place where I go is about 50 kilometers. And in the 50 kilometers, there's a beautiful highway and that, that narrows down to the narrow lanes and the roads of the city, wherein there is huge traffic jams. So traveling that 50 kilometers should normally take about one hour, maybe one and a half hours. But with the possibility thinking, by playing it safe, you got to give a leeway of another 45 minutes to one hour, maybe two and a half hours. So I need to plan my, my, my travel to and fro from the place of work to the airport and back in such a way that I make a leeway for this, assuming that things might go wrong, probability. Many cases it doesn't happen, but what if it happens? So is this alive in your brain? And if it happens, after my awareness that it could happen, would I not be in a better situation to be proactive as and when it happens? That's the point, right? So, taking it further, in other words, the choices for action are more when we make multiple working hypotheses. One of the building blocks of integrative thinking is multiple working hypotheses. So keep this alive in your, in your, in your minds, friends. Keep multiple working, multiple working hypotheses alive in every situation that you are in. Now, for you to keep a multiple working hypothesis, you need to have an internal training, a mindset which is not rigid which doesn't take status quo for granted, which doesn't take status quo for granted. Constantly you should remember that your status quo is changing. When you realize that, then the multiple working hypothesis comes. Is it not true that most of us take action only when there's a panic? Is it not true that we do things only when there's a, the emergency to do it? Right? So could we see that in advance? Now I talk about the third topic in this, which is called as the opposable mind. We need to ask ourselves, why do we at most times choose a single working hypothesis? Most of you will agree with whatever I've said so far. Yes, there's a possibility that rains might happen, freak rain. There's a possibility there may be a havoc, a flood havoc. But in spite of knowing this, why do we go for single working hypothesis? Most of us do it, right? It's because we have been taught and we have learned that in order to take decisions, we need to eliminate among alternatives to arrive at a single course of action. We have been taught. We have been taught. Right? The deeper purpose of this approach is to survive and take action without getting confused and chaotic. You know, when you eliminate, you get a temporary mental comfort saying that, look, I'm not into confusion anymore. I'm using the word temporary. I get a temporary mental comfort saying that, look, I'm out of it. I don't want that, so I've eliminated it. I'm taking this action. To put it in a very humorous way, when we get married, you have two choices, two, two different prospective spouses. So you choose one. And then you choose one and you're very content with that, isn't it? Now, a similar situation happens because at that point of time, when you choose, you say, yes, this is it. Now, that particular choice which I make is being done with a single working hypothesis because it gives me comfort, it removes me from chaos. When I am training myself into integrative thinking initially, friends, initially when I am training myself into integrative thinking, when there are multiple possibilities open, 
I might start getting more and more ideas and there are very few people who can take many ideas because they get confused. When it comes to action, people prefer one single hypothesis only. An ordinary person usually prefers one single hypothesis for taking an action. Hence, we take a single hypothesis. Because if I have to take an action in which there is no chaos, there is clarity, wherein I feel comfortable, then usually it is one single hypothesis. Nothing will go wrong. Don't worry. I am there. Take care of it and then take an action. Do things remain the way they are as promised? No. They change. Then you realize, oh, I wish I had taken the other option. Right? Now, this is a point to be pondered over. Multiple hypothesis is not the only thing. Single hypothesis is not bad. But single hypothesis has got its limitations. Please understand that. That's the only contention. Nothing else. In most cases, we fall back upon single hypothesis and action. But while I am doing that, am I only into single hypothesis is the question. If I am into it, then there is an issue. Then I become rigid. When situations change, I am not in a position to adapt. And I lose out. Right? The deeper purpose of this approach is to survive and take action without getting confused and chaotic. In other words, whenever an issue confronts us, we tend to automatically choose that approach that makes us comfortable and which works. We do this by eliminating. Now when we eliminate, rather before we eliminate, we go through multiple opposing thoughts. Is it true or not? Lots of confusion in the brain, to be or not to be. Right? We rarely look at both these thoughts. We have evolved the natural habit of eliminating. So we consider the other thought or other thoughts as opposing. Anything that is opposing we are not comfortable with, so we eliminate. All human beings seek stability and comfort. So their thoughts and actions are usually by the process of eliminating, making them comfortable. Right? We need to remind ourselves that the thought we chose, we choose by eliminating the opposing thought is there because of the opposing thought. Right? But if similar to the fact, it is similar to the fact that good is good with respect to bad. If bad did not exist, then we would not recognize good as good. Right? Thinkers who exploit opposing ideas to construct a new solution enjoy a built-in advantage over thinkers who consider only one model at a time. Possibility thinking. There are lots of experiences and uh, observations which I could narrate in my world of training which, have, which, which I'm into. Uh, when I do a behavioral training for companies, senior leaders, I come across many people who are into multiple working hypothesis. They say something today, then tomorrow they something, say something different. For the person who doesn't understand the larger picture, he'll feel that this person doesn't have a mind of his own. But he's integrating. Lots of stories are there. Lots of real incidents are there. Right? Uh, ability to use the opposable mind is an advantage anytime in any era. And an opposable mind may be more than an advantage in today's world. In this information saturated age, where each new bit of data complicates the picture that is already complex, integrative thinking may be the only way out. Are we not living in a complex world now? So much of information overload. So many things happening together. You go to the shopping mall to buy something, too many offerings, price range. The one that you want, the one that you do not want, the one you desire to have. So many things are there. So in this entire complexity, you could really go crazy. But if you have an integrative approach, purchasing in a mall also becomes very easy. Right? So now we go through the second case. The second case is titled as All the Comforts of Home. A very interesting case about the famous Four Seasons hotels about which all of us are familiar. Right? So let's read out from the slides. The integrative thinking enabled Isidore Sharp, the gentleman's name is Isidore Sharp, to found the successful chain of Four Seasons Hotel and Resorts Limited, whose brand is synonymous with the ultimate luxury in the minds of the guests. Some of you must have stayed in these, in these hotels. Uh, four seasons. I have stayed a few times and uh, it speaks a lot about the luxury it gives you with a human touch. 
Okay, so let's see how it uh, how this was arrived at. Shops started with a smallish roadside motel that offered intimate comfort. Underline the word intimate. What's a motel? A motel is a motor inn. In the highways in US, when you're traveling long distances or for that matter anywhere in the world, you need to stop at night to take rest and then drive further next morning. So we have a wayside inn which is called as a motel. So in the motel, you need to sleep there, a comfortable bed, okay, clean place and maybe in the morning you need to have some little bit of breakfast or tea or whatever and then move away from the place to the further destination. So just for one overnight stay, what people seek is not an expensive place. At the same time, they would like to have the warmth of a home. So motels and inns actually provide that, if you notice. So this is something which happens for a short period of time, but, but which gives you the comfort of the home. But when I get the comfort of a home at a lower price, certain amenities, certain conveniences may not be available. For example, I may not have, uh, let's say, a, 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 a good luxurious bathroom. I may not have a, a bed which is really a little more uh, expensive. I may not have the air conditioning for, 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 the, for that matter. So there are certain luxuries which I may not be given considering the pricing of the motel. But what I am essentially seeking for, I am seeking for comfort. What if over and above the comfort, I am also getting the luxury? I may have to pay more. How much more is a question. So on one hand, Isidore Sharp was running these motels which were at the low pricing meant for people who are staying overnight and going away. And so there was an intimate comfort available like a home. And next what he did was he went to the other side of the spectrum and he built a large convention hotel in Toronto in Canada and both the projects were profitable. But Sharp was not comfortable. What was he not comfortable about? I mean, he is getting his money. Anybody in his place should be comfortable. On one hand, he is getting a huge amount of business from the motels. On the other hand, he has got a large convention center, a super luxurious place where everything is available at a, at a call. Right? Now, he was not comfortable with the fact that he wanted to provide all the luxuries of the large convention center to the motel people. At the same time, he wanted to carry the, com the, the intimacy and the personal touch which the motels have into the five-star hotels or the, or the convention centers. All of us will agree that when you go to uh, a large five-star hotel or something, everything is good and luxurious, but there is a certain amount of impersonal uh, feeling as if you are in a strange place and the personal touch is not that warm. A few concessions are not made if you want them, right? You ask for something extra, you are billed for it or they may give you a little grudgingly or something. So one doesn't communicate that informally and get things done in a large place by and large, usually. Things have changed today, of course, right? So there is a certain amount of aloofness that happens. Service is available. Everything is available for you, all the luxuries, but a certain amount of aloofness, a certain amount of dehumanized way of working. It used to happen long back. Now, these days things are different, right? So on one hand, a large convention center, good profits, all the luxuries. On the other side, a human touch and these uh, inns which are operating. Now, he said that I want to bring both of them together. I want to integrate them together. I want to come out with a, a model which is bringing the best of both worlds, the intimacy and the comforts of an inn and the luxuries of a convention center. That was the integrative thinking which Isidore Shab got into, right? So let's read through this. His motel was too small for gym, swimming pool and other sort of luxuries. And his convention hotel had all the luxuries but lacked the intimacy and the personal touch or the personal care that travelers value. The two types of formats for boarding and lodging appear to be standing apart in terms of all characteristics. Two conflicting situations arose, personal touch at low cost least amenities, expensive and large range of amenities. This business model was also working very well. 
this was also working very well but Isidro Sharp through his integrated thinking created a new business model unthought of before a business model a type of a format which was never thought of by anybody before and that integrative thinking has lasted for so many years and now other people are also replicating it what is it let's understand now that's a gentleman is it was sharp for is it was sharp it was not a problem because he rather than choose one model or the other each with this inherent shortcomings would go for other another alternative altogether he said not a not b i'll go for c and what is his c he used his opposable mind to create a new model a hotel with intimacy of origin of his original inn and the amenities of the large convention center large convention hotel and he created the four seasons with ultimate in person luxury service with ultimate in person luxury service he was deliberating upon the fact that what if i create a model which is better than an inn in terms of comforts and charge little extra would people buy it would people come there many of his critics said no it's not possible and they were they said it will the whole model will fail but this gentleman took a chance he took a risk integrative thinkers think in an integrative fashion and they are willing to put the risk into action and that's what he exactly did the case 1 and 2 which we have explained the first one about lee chin and this one about isadro shab shows how integrative thinking helps people to solve problems now we come to case 3 now we come to case 3 case 3 is about the legendary fmcg company procter and gamble headed by the then ceo aj lafley and this is a run through about what happened there aj lafley took over the helm of png as a ceo in the year 2000 it was in a very bad shape business wise its growth slowed down almost to a standstill and the earlier ceo had quit due to some controversy and 7 out of 10 brands were facing market share declines png was spending on research but bringing fewer and fewer new products now the fmcg market fast moving consumer goods market sustains and survives and grows only when new product offerings are given to the consumers new product offering means what consumers are always asking for more and more variety and consumers go through boredom when they use a consumer goods and so they keep on asking for more their taste start declining and they want newer things coming up so for newer products to be created by the company they need to go through research and development research and development cost money so i need money to invest on an r&d to come out with a new product if i don't come out with a new product what happens competition takes over and they'll be ahead of me i'll perish if i put my money into r&d the results of r&d take some time to come so i may be blocking in that much amount of resources so these two are two opposing things if i want to stay competitive i need to come out with new products to stay competitive i need to have r&d for r&d i need money where does the money come from only when i make profits so these two things oppose this was a dilemma which they were facing now let's see what happened png was spending on research but bringing out fewer and fewer new products so the money was going it was getting invested but the returns were not coming next the company had lost contact with the customers why because new products were not coming and the old products did not have much of glamour did not have much of use because there were better products coming in the market by other people analysts concluded that png had lost control over its costs there was a threat from competitors with lower cost png's only response could be reduce prices of the existing products but they were already not remunerative there were hardly any margins left one couldn't make much of profits if they reduce the price further an opposing school of thought held that png had stopped innovating and it could survive only if it uses innovation to differentiate its products from its cut price competitors png had to charge premium prices and restore profitability that was a challenge right now and that's mr lafley taking it further 
Lafley had two conflicts in his mind. Cost control coupled with lower pricing reduce the cost of manufacturing of existing products, what we call it as cost pull and price push. When I, when I reduce the cost of the existing products being manufactured, I could perhaps price get, I get an advantage of a gap between the cost and the pricing. I could do that, cut cross and be price competitive or here I could invest into R&D, sharp differentiation, premium pricing, emphasize innovation etc. This is costing money and time. This is something that can I do it right now is a big question because I am not doing well. Right? These are the conflicts. What did Lafley do? Let's see. Lafley eliminated layers of management, cut functional units at the headquarters, outsourced, promoted young managers, stressed on the importance of capability building and focused on generating cash and cutting costs. In short, he took a proactive action. But most importantly, what comes to my what we would like to identify is he emphasized on design, thus innovating and strengthening PNG brands. He tirelessly communicated his passion for delighting customers and delivering superior value to them. What he did was he started emphasizing on designing of newer products. And then he started wherever there was a flab, wherever things were too much heavy resource intensive, he tried to cut down on that. Now, when you are in a panic situation to do this action of a large organization like that, it takes a lot of integrative thinking. He did just that. One of the initiatives taken by him and many other FMCG people is when they find that R&D is not affordable by us, they give it to a contractor, a person who is making the products for them and they tell him to invest in an R&D with the promise that we will be able to give you sustained business over a period of time. So I don't put my money, the contractor puts his money, he develops his R&D, I assist him, I train him, I coach him and then he comes out with new products with my name, my brand and then I am able to sell it. So I am sustaining myself, I am also making someone grow. This is one of the initiatives taken by many FMCG companies, we know it. Right? So, what's the result of this? PNG started to change to charge more for products than it had ever charged before. It introduced new Ole Skin Cream, very famous, all of us know, and unheard of $25 for a 3 ounce bottle, quite an economical price for a premium product. In short, Lafley integrated both the opposing strategies, invested on in innovation, and priced the product competitively. That's what he exactly did. The third case we're talking about right now. And now, what kind of mind could weave together a unified strategy for such two such different lines of thoughts? There must be something here in the thinking process that has brought these two things together. What made it happen? The results of thinking in terms of and rather than or have been breathtaking. Lafley led PNG to consistently strong organic revenue growth, double digit profit growth and a doubling of the company's stock prices within four years. In doing so, Lafley established himself as one of the finest CEOs of his era. Lafley said, I'm not an either or kind of guy. I'm not an either or guy. I'm an and guy. I'm a person who integrates. That was his contention. Right? So now, having gone through three cases, we are coming to the fourth one. Many of you know about this particular case, this company called Red Hat. And this gentleman is, he is wearing a red hat if you notice, he is Bob Young. In 1995, Red Hat INC was posting a sales of merely $14 million. It was a marketing, it was marketing software. 1995. Bob Young was a founder and he chose to integrate two opposing strategies. He wanted his customers to get control over their product in their in its usage and upgradation, and at the same time, he wanted this offer coming to them at an affordable price. A very good integrative thinker. Okay. What is he wanted? He wanted customers to be self-dependent. Now, what's the product? The product is a software package based on Linux. Let's go through the slide. For growth, there were two choices and Young liked none. What are they? Red Hat, INC and Bob Young, two choices were in front of him. 
develop and sell proprietary software like Microsoft or and Oracle, invest heavily in R&D, guard intellectual property jealously. This is what the established players do. We have Microsoft on one side, Oracle. They create software packages. We all buy it. Most of us are buying it, right? And when we buy, what happens? There's a thing called a source code. It remains with them. Any upgradation, anything that you want, you need to go back to them. So they sell a product at a premium price, holding the reins in their hands. And they make this product proprietary. So you cannot have flexibility on your own. You have to be dependent on them all the time. Right? This is one type of a business model. The second business model is talking about sell software with source code for a small price. Low margin profits made through large volumes reducing the product to a commodity. And revenue uncertain due to numerous new entrants who scare away corporate customers. All of us know about this software called Linux, open source code. You can download it. You can use it on your own. Anybody can do it. Now, I could be selling Linux. Since it's open source code, there will be many other people who will be also selling it in a different, different package forms. And it becomes like a commodity. High volumes, low margin, low profits. When this happens, many of my competitors will take over. It will be like a cutthroat competition. But I'll be through aggressive marketing, I could get more and more customers and fatten my margins, fatten my profits. But that's a very long cry. So on one hand, I could be like this or I could be like this. Now, which of the two I need to do is a question. Bob Young took a decision. He found that both the strategies are unsatisfactory. He wanted something different. The first was distasteful for him because he felt he was he was ideologically committed to open software movement and its flagship Linux. He wished customers to have control over their software through access to source code which proprietary operating systems operators would not offer. He wanted customers to be in control, not dependent. The second choice was distasteful also. It was orthodox, so-called free. Software placed unacceptable constraints on Red Hat's growth. Market penetration, profitability, they couldn't make much of profits out of this. With this model, Red Hat would be just one among the many sellers of Linux based operating systems and not the biggest of the diverse lot. They had to stand out and also make money. But when I stand out, I don't want to stand out in a way in which customers are depending on me, they must be independent. So how do I make profits? By seeing that customers are independent, I get more customers. At the same time, I am able to get my profits happening. That was a thing. So Young did not reject either. What he really did was his strategy based on integrative thinking was Red Hat's software would continue to be free. First thing which he did was I'll keep it free. Like the proprietary software giants, Red Hat would profit by establishing an ongoing service relationship with its members. Any software that you install has got updates as all of us know. So he said that look, I'll be giving you Linux in my form. And once you buy it from me, at a slightly premium price compared to my other competitors, I promise you an ongoing updating of the various versions as and when they come. That's the type of an AMC, annual maintenance contract, which you can sign between you and me. Now, this is something unthought of in a commodity based type of a package like this. He did it, right? So, Young re-engineered Red Hat software to market available as a free download over the internet. He decided to incorporate the aspects of each choice. He integrated both, right? And then that one move which sowed panic among his colleagues when he proposed it, vaulted, it took Red Hat ahead of all its competitors. Linux rivals and established the company as the only Linux provider of sufficient scale to gain the trust of big corporations. That corporate support established Red Hat's dominance and ensured its financial strength. What really happened was they were in a position to go by numbers at a little premium. And downloads is a big irritation for people or rather downloads of new versions. When updates come, if there are a number of user departments in a company, 
all of them have to depend on the IT depart IT department and in turn with a proprietary company which is selling the software. Now this was taken care of by one single initiative taken. When you buy a software from me, I will be able to give you the updates regularly. So leave that headache to me. That was a contention. That's what actually made it happen differently. Right?